ahead and get started. I'm Jan Masaoka. I'm the CEO of the California Association of Nonprofits. We say nonprofits for short. And welcome to this nonprofit town hall uh, with two of our elected officials, State Senator Scott Weiner and Assemblymember David Chu. And we're also joined by Lucy Salcido Carter, the Policy Director at Cal Nonprofits, and Joe Wilson, uh, the Executive Director of Hospitality House, which is located in San Francisco's Tenderloin neighborhood. Uh, I'll introduce them more in a little bit more detail in a minute, but just to say a word about why we're having these town halls. Uh, I think that I think that never before have nonprofits been as visible, right? On one hand, right, we can, every day, every news feed, every TV picture is about people waiting in line at the food bank, getting tested in a homeless shelter, um, working at a preschool. Um, and at the same time, so while we have this incredibly high visibility and high capacity work that we're doing, um, at the same time, nonprofits on the other end of that spectrum are completely shut down. Every theater, uh, every orchestra, every museum in California is completely shut down. So we're kind of all across that spectrum. Um, but despite the visibility of the nonprofit community right now in the media, we're not always getting the, the help that we need from our local and state and federal governments. So it's a, an incredibly important time for us to hear from our elected officials, how they're supporting nonprofits, but also for them to hear from all of us directly um, what we're experiencing, what kind of need is help is, is helping, what kind of work is helping, and if there's anything that's, that's going wrong, that's kind of inadvertently hurting nonprofits or that's not helping nonprofits in the wrong way, it's important for them to get those messages as well. So again, please feel free to introduce yourself, make comments and questions in the, in the chat box, <clears throat> and we'll go ahead uh, and get started. So just to let, let you know a couple of housekeeping things. Um, so we have everybody on mute because we're expecting so many people, but you can go ahead and use the chat box. Uh, you might want to write that telephone, the, uh, oh, there isn't a telephone, is there a telephone number up? Yeah, there's a telephone number so that if you do have a problem, you can call that telephone number. And we have three of our staff today doing tech support, um, Christine Metropolis, um, Karina Paredes Alzara, and uh, Christina Dragonetti. Um, so you can also, if you're having tech problems, write tech in all caps in the chat box and they'll be sure to see your message and try to be able to reach out to you directly to try to help you on that. Um, I also want to just say that, uh, that both the Senator and the Assemblymen, their staff are on this call, not just they themselves. And so even if we don't get to all the questions, their staff is listening and learning, uh, and may be able to get back to you individually, but more important, all these questions and comments help inform the positions um, and the work that they're doing uh, for all of us in Sacramento. Um, so uh, let me just see here. So let me just start to kind of set just a little bit of kind of context, like a quick, you know, very fast um, uh, federal overview. Lucy from Lucy, our policy director, just to set the context for what's happening in Washington before we, we find out from our Sacramento electives exactly what's going on in Sacramento. So Lucy. Oh, okay, um, I'll jump in. So there hasn't been any major federal COVID-19 relief legislation recently. We did have the CARES Act um, that was enacted on March 27th, and there were some benefits to some nonprofits that came out of that particular act. Um, there were kind of three key areas. Um, there was the development of the Paycheck Protection Program, or the PPP, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. There was also the agreement from the federal government to cover 50% of unemployment insurance reimbursement for self-insured organizations, so including nonprofits. And there was also funding to states and local governments, relief funding to states, state and local governments. So um, as many of you know, accessing the PPP was a bit of a challenge, especially at, in the first round of funding, but there was a second round of funding and more nonprofits have been able to access the funding um, through that second round. Still a small percentage compared to for-profit organizations. Um, so, and then there's been some additional legislation related to the PPP that has extended the length of time for forgiveness on that loan to 24 weeks and also um, allowing a, a lower percentage of payroll for forgiveness on the loan. Um, and by the way, that 
loan program is a forgiveness loan program and is still open. It's been extended until August 8th. So if you haven't applied, I'll put in the chat box um, the website for the SBA. You have to work through a, a lending institution. Um, there are all kinds of lending institutions um, available to, to help you with that loan. Um, it is a forgivable loan. So if you jump through all the right hoops, it's like a grant. Uh, just a couple of other quick things. Um, uh, there, the 50% uh, reimbursement for the unemployment insurance is great, but nonprofits are still advocating for 100% reimbursement um, because it's really now with uh, revenues being down and, and all of the layoffs, um, even paying the 50% of reimbursement will be a challenge for those self-insured nonprofits. And then one other thing, um, we really support in whatever future relief um, law comes into place, that there be continuing resources for state and local governments. A lot of nonprofits have benefited from that. So we're continuing to advocate for that. And particularly with all of the budget cuts that we know the state and local governments are experiencing. So that's just a, a little bit of information now. And I'll turn it back over to you, Jan, to turn it to the elected officials. Thanks, Lucy. I appreciate that. Um, so I'm going to introduce both Scott Weiner and David Chu at once and then have Scott talk and turn it over to David. So let me just say a few words about each one of them. So uh, Scott Weiner, as most of you know, is a, our state senator um, uh, from San Francisco, Colma, Daly City, and parts of South San Francisco. And before that, of course, he was a, a member of the San Francisco Board of Supervisors. And in fact, he was my supervisor. And something I, I, it's, I'm going to put this on my resume, but when we had a block party and he attended, he actually came and, uh, and uh, to my root, beer, my root beer tasting station. Um, and he ha had a strong opinion about which was the best root beer and which was the worst one. But, um, you know, I think Scott has been really a champion for affordable housing, for health care, immigrant rights, and LGBT rights. And you hear that list of his, some of his key issues, and you immediately know that he's a champion of the nonprofit community. And uh, there are so many things that we, we work very closely with him on minimum wage matters, for example, and a whole host of other things that, that support the workforce, support the nonprofit workforce as well as nonprofit organizations. Um, David Chu is the assembly member for the eastern part of San Francisco. He's also the chair of the Asian and Pacific Islander Caucus. And I think, you know, um, we have to spend the whole rest of this time listing all the nonprofit activities he's been, been involved in, but in particular, he's been a board member of the Youth Policy Institute, the Chinatown Community Development Center, uh, Partners Ending Domestic ab uh, Abuse, and many others. And he's really well known as a champion for small business and nonprofits. And, um, uh, and in part of his commitment to the nonprofit community is he and 30 other assembly members and 1,300 nonprofits signed a letter to the governor asking for relief for the nonprofits that contract with state government. And uh, we're still hoping to see some action on that because we're still seeing a lot of confusion uh, with state nonprofits that have contracts with state government. But you know, most of them are really well known to the nonprofit community, just seeing all the different people signing in. I'm sure many of you, um, you know, have, uh, have, participated in nonprofit activities with them and maybe, you know, argued with them about some policy or another. So they're really old friends to nonprofits. Um, so Scott, when you start and let us know what's going on in Sacramento and what, what should nonprofits be knowing right now? Unmute. There we go. Um, a lot of people would like to mute me, but, uh, <laughs> um, First of all, thank you for uh, having uh, me and, and Assembly Member Chu here today. Um, this is just so important because our nonprofit community just provides life-saving services. Uh, a lot of times people don't realize how important this community is just for society uh, to function. And so I'm so appreciative. And uh, it's been great working with Cal Nonprofits and Jennifer Fearing um, uh, their advocate and your advocate in the Capitol. And I'll talk in a minute about a huge fight that we uh, took on and that uh, Cal Nonprofits and Jennifer were a key partner uh, in that effort. Uh, you know, for me, it's, uh, this is very personal. When I, I arrived in San Francisco in 1997, and long before I ran for office or even got really involved in politics,
politics in San Francisco at all. My, my entree into the community um, was uh, helping to build our LGBT community center in San Francisco. Uh, and I was a young gay man who came to the city. We didn't have a community center and there were a lot of people who were in need of uh, services, a lot of vulnerable people in, our com in the LGBT community who needed services and we needed a community center. Uh, and so I spent years uh, on that board of directors, including as co-chair, uh, and we got it built and we got it opened and uh, it's uh, an amazing asset in our community uh, today. So that was my entry point into San Francisco through, uh, you know, through a nonprofit. And that's how I got to know the community. Uh, and so I'm very passionate about it. And over the years, um, I have worked with just so many nonprofits in San Francisco as a private resident, as a member of the Board of Supervisors, as a senator, uh, and, um, and, I, so I, and I see firsthand uh, every day how people's lives are benefited and, uh, and saved uh, by yeah. our nonprofit partners, whether it's at-risk uh, youth or homeless youth or homeless seniors or seniors who are at risk of isolation or people who are food insecure, people living with HIV, people facing eviction. It's just it run, every like life, important thing in life, um, our nonprofits are coming to the rescue of so many people. Uh, and during COVID, we're seeing it's like in spades in terms of the life-saving impacts. I, during the, um, the, hard, the several months of the hardcore shelter in place, I spent a lot of time volunteering for, uh, to try to get food out. Uh, to people, and I volunteered at uh, the food bank and at Project Open Hand and Meals on Wheels and St. Anthony's and and other amazing organizations. Uh, and I'll tell you, the times I uh, volunteered at the food bank, uh, I've never seen a line as long as what I saw there. Um, it was just e extraordinary and so depressing about how many people were food insecure, and I knew a lot of people who would probably never asked for help with food in their entire lives and they had to overcome the unfortunately the shame and they shouldn't have shame but people experience shame that they have to ask for help and i know this is happening with nonprofits in every single uh sector i i know that you know there, there are so many uh we see it with food insecurity we see it with seniors who are isolated at home even more so than usual and need help so that they can get what they need uh we see it with um renters who are wondering if they're going to be evicted and um, we know that that situation is just going to get worse because for the first few months people had maybe had some savings or they're getting the extra six hundred dollars from the federal government unemployment but which is going to go away and i think we're going to see waves of evictions in the coming months and so we're going to rely on our nonprofits who uh help renters stay housed um when you look at um just so many vulnerable pe people who need services who need help and so at this moment when nonprofits are more important than ever um their nonprofits are, are facing potential extinction in terms of being able to pay the rent and being able to pay salaries and just being able to uh, survive uh, and this is very very real and the last thing that we need uh, is to have a mass extinction event of our nonprofits. And so we're doing a few things in Sacramento. We did try, I introduced legislation, Senate Bill 939 uh, this year, which for small businesses and nonprofits to put an eviction moratorium in place. Uh, and then also for hospitality uh, sector businesses to uh, give them more leverage to renegotiate their leases. Uh, and again, Cal Nonprofits, thank you for standing with us and fighting with on our side on that bill. Um, it was uh, um, a hard fight and the commercial real estate industry had a complete temper tantrum meltdown about the bill. It's the only way I can describe it and just very melodramatic and exaggerating and ultimately the bill died. And what is really sad, um, and people should talk to their representatives about this, if for anyone who's not in San Francisco here, because David Chu and Phil Ting were very supportive of the bill. Um, I thought when I introduced SB 939, I thought it was going to be like one of 20 different bills trying to help small businesses and nonprofits uh, avoid losing their space because, you know, that, that's just devastating. And as far as I know, it's the only bill that got introduced in the legislature. 
And I was really surprised. And I think the governor and, our, and the legislature need to step up and take on this hard issue. This is a major issue facing our state. So we haven't given up. We're gonna keep looking for possibilities, but we can't just let happenstance take over. And well, whoever gets evicted from their space gets evicted, whoever doesn't, doesn't. We have to be intentional about it. We have to be clear that what we want society to look like after COVID-19, we have to make that happen. We can't just risk it and throw the dice. I also think that the state needs to step up with, with emergency funding for nonprofits. Uh, we were working with our LGBTQ nonprofits uh, specifically, uh, but we need to go, uh, of course, broader than that. And there needs to be a significant state investment in making sure that we're shoring up uh, our nonprofits. So uh, we need to just work together and keep fighting. Uh, if we don't get it done in, uh, by August 31st, uh, who knows, maybe we demand a special session and keep working through the fall because we are in an emergency right now in this state uh, and we need to do whatever it takes uh, to, to have a safety net so that people can survive. Thank you. Thanks. David, what are your thoughts? Well, first of all, good afternoon. Let me just start by thanking Cal Nonprofits and, and Jan and Jennifer Fearing uh, for just tremendous advocacy and partnership with those of us who are your representatives, I uh, just want to say I have only one thing I've disappointed Jan and you and that I've not had a chance to try your root beer, but uh, hopefully someday soon uh, we'll all be able to. Uh, it, was, it, was it was really good, David. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Look forward to that. And uh, of course, it's uh, great to uh, be with my good friend and my state senator, uh, Senator Weiner, who's been just a tremendous advocate, but also partner with me and with Phil Ting as we're uh, pushing through during uh, during these times. Um, and let me say, I've just been skimming through the list of participants and, and they're just a lot of old friends and, and allies and, uh, and, and folks that we have all been in the trenches for so many years working on this. Um, as Jen mentioned, uh, I've spent a lot of time in, in the nonprofit sector. I used to work as a civil rights attorney for a nonprofit organization. Before I had any inkling that I would ever become an elected official, I served on probably about a dozen different nonprofit boards in many, many different sectors that I think are represented here today. I'm married to uh, my wife, who's a director of a nonprofit serving refugee foster care youth. And, um, and so I feel like I'm sort of part of, part of the family. And I just wanna say, you know, Scott did, just thank you. Um, you know, in the best of times, um, you are doing the Lord's work. Uh, you are filling in the cracks between the private sector and the public sector on the most intense needs, uh, the, the, the hardest issues that uh, either government or the private sector have not been able to, to address. Um, and you're not doing it with the compensation that I think many of us feel you deserve. Uh, but we know that we are in the worst of times, uh, the pandemic, the recession, a national conversation about structural racism and inequality. And, um, and then on top of that, um, the biggest budget challenges that any of us have ever seen in our lifetime. Uh, when I first took office 12 years ago as president of the Board of Supervisors, uh, literally overnight, we saw a half a billion dollar budget deficit representing about 10% of San Francisco's budget. And I remember talking to, I think at least 20, 25 of you on this call in different meetings about how are we gonna get through this? And now Scott and I, we've never experienced a 54 billion dollar budget deficit, which is what we are dealing at, at the state level. And um, you know, I am hearing every day, not just through my wife, uh, but through all my friends and, and those of you working in the field, just how incredibly difficult this has been, right? On your budgets, on your workforces, who are, as, you know, are on the front lines, potentially being exposed to the virus, uh, dealing with trauma uh, at a level we've never seen. Uh, you know, like Scott, when I'm at home in the district and we're not in Sacramento, I try at least once or twice a week to get out to something typically hosted by a nonprofit, whether it be a food bank line, a blood drive, uh, those of you who are working on mental health issues, on homelessness, on substance abuse, families, kids, and the need is just astronomical. So um, I just, again, know how much you are going through. Um, I was asked to speak for just a few minutes about the budget because I serve on the Assembly Budget Committee and I know that our colleague, uh, Assembly Member Phil Ting, wanted to join us but uh, wasn't able to as the chair of the Budget Committee. But as a member of the committee, let me also just thank you for tremendous advocacy. Um, there were so many aspects of the budget when it was first proposed that 
um, but for the advocacy of so many of you on this call, I think would not have happened, right? So the governor was forced to make some horrific choices. And, uh, and when it came to food banks, you know, Meals on Wheels and others, we fought to increase funding for food banks and to reject proposals to cut Meals on Wheels. Uh, when it came to healthcare, uh, we had to make sure that money went back to stabilize uh, cuts to, to, to healthcare and uh, to mental health. Um, there are folks on this call, I think I saw Annie Chung. Annie called me when the proposed cuts to the multipurpose senior service program, MSSP, and the community-based adult service program uh, were on the chopping block. And I wasn't aware of it because the budget is so big and there are so many bad things happening. And he brought it to my attention, she brought it to my attention, and three people within 12 hours said, shoot, you got to do something about it. And uh, helped us whip together a letter that Senator Wiener and others signed. And we were able to fight back and, and make sure that that gets restored. Medi-Cal benefits around adult dental, diabetes, speech therapy, um, you know, making sure we have paid, uh, paid family leave protections for workers, um, making sure that we're providing for our immigrant families who because of their documented status are, handing, are, are hanging on the line and uh, ensuring that we're moving forward the earned income tax credit for some folks in that world. I could go on and on, but, but for your advocacy, the budget would be far worse. And I just wanna say that and, and say it's important for us to continue this conversation. Um, let me just end with sort of two final points, which is uh, like Scott, we're all working on things that are trying to stop the hemorrhage and the worst aspects of what the pandemic recession and racism and inequality is sort of compounding in our world right now. A few things that I'm working on, uh, Senator Wiener has focused on the plight of small businesses and nonprofits in the commercial tenant context. I have the leading bill, AB 1436, um, that essentially says tenants should not be evicted because they owe COVID rent. At some point, the eviction moratoriums are gonna get lifted. Uh, it almost happened uh, this current month. And uh, when it happens, uh, we are expecting literally millions of Californians who haven't been able to pay some portion of back rent, they could be subjected to an immediate eviction. So I have the bill to move forward the conversation of how do we stabilize those folks in place. Um, I also have uh, another bill, AB 2520, which has been relatively non-controversial, but I think relevant to this world to help low-income Californians access public benefit programs by make it, e making it easier to access medical records, uh, which are often very difficult uh, when your constituents are applying for various benefits. Uh, for those of you who work on mental health and homeless issues, I also have the bill to try to start to stabilize the, uh, the uh, adult, uh, the ARF world, the adult residential facilities world, uh, and, uh, and working to make sure that uh, folks who are living in those settings don't get forced out onto the street, forced out into homelessness. And then I also have a number of bills trying to ensure that every city be accountable to all of us to tackling homelessness and uh, having a plan and devoting resources to making sure that coronavirus and homelessness do not lead to uh, an even worse crisis right now. The last thing I want to say is um, Scott and I and others are involved in a conversation about additional revenue because um, as difficult as things are right now, I think many of us think there probably are ways for parts of the sectors in California to play a little bit more of a role in stabilizing the situation for everyone else. So stay tuned about that conversation, but know uh, behind the scenes we're talking about it. Um, you know, we were able, at least for now, to figure out how to balance this budget at this moment, but um, it's very possible that if we don't get additional federal stimulus dollars, if the economy continues to go south, if we continue to stay closed, uh, things will be 10 times worse. And so we're looking at different options uh, in addition to the work that Senator Wiener and I are trying to do to make sure all of our Californians get their uh, EDD unemployment benefits. So with that, um, I'll turn it back to uh, Jan and just thank you, look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Assembly Member. You know, um, both neither one of you guys is cutting anybody any slack. I mean, Scott used the phrase mass extinction of nonprofits and David, you said things could be 10 times worse. So um, 
thanks for framing this <laughs> kind of the alarm really the alarming very fearful climate that we really are all in before i ask joe to speak about kind of nonprofits on the ground though we have a lot of uh, arts nonprofits on the call today and you spoke up both of you spoke a lot about low-income californians but also about human services and health and i'm wondering if you could just say a word about what you're doing for arts or what the, what government is or should be doing for arts organizations I'm happy to jump in for a second while Scott is, uh, is, is hitting his mute button. But, um, you know, as a, uh, as a, as a former violinist, uh, as someone who has been very close to the, uh, the music and arts world in a lot of contexts, um, it's absolutely, you know, I, I would say our artists remind us, uh, kind of remind us of what our reality is and what our vision should be. Uh, and are typically an afterthought on what it is that we need. And I said this before coronavirus, I, I serve on a committee that uh, very few members of the public know about and a lot of members don't wanna serve on, which is the Arts and Entertainment and Tourism Committee in the assembly. And I've been telling the arts community for years that we need to develop more of a statewide coalition to push for arts funding because our per capita funding for the arts in California is ranked close to the bottom. And I'd been hoping we were gonna have this conversation and then of course coronavirus hit and we all know what the impact has been on our institutions that are not just critical for art's sake for itself, but critical for our economy, for our tourism, uh, for making sure that uh, people are making it. So um, I am very open to you know different ideas and solutions in this area. And one thing I should have mentioned is, uh, uh, you know, when it came to federal stimulus, uh, and I'm sure Senator Wiener feels the same way, uh, we've all been incredibly uh, disappointed, certainly in the first round of PPP, but in how stimulus dollars did not get out to everyone who needed it in our communities, particularly in the nonprofit world. And I've certainly heard from our friends in the arts community about the challenges there. Um, we've got to do more. And this is where I think the conversation about additional revenues is so important and what it's going to take for us to build the consensus to, to get there. Yeah, I, I, you know, I think San Francisco has been an amazing uh, leader in funding uh, the arts. We can always do more, but uh, between you know the some of the hotel tax and just other sources and general fund, uh, we've really I think put our money where our mouth is in terms of supporting the arts. Again, we can always do more. Um, I think at the state level, it's it's just more. I think it's less in the culture to be. You know, for the state to be proactively supportive in terms of public money for the arts, but uh, we know that the arts play. A really, and I, I think sometimes there is, uh, I think, a perception um, that uh, uh, that maybe the arts are, it's not as critical. It's more of a luxury to have arts, but arts are like central, and we know that that kids learn better and are more well-rounded, have better education when they have an arts education. Uh, we know that for um, for everyone, just having a healthier society, uh, and that artists are, uh, you know, so much of our culture, especially in a place like San Francisco, but everywhere. Like having a place without artists is like unimaginable. It's not. That's not a community where I would ever want to live. Um, and so we have to be, like, and I think other countries, especially like in Europe, get it, and are just very so supportive of arts. We need to do more. Uh, in our budget. And again, it's, it's gotten a lot harder now, but we have to keep this very much on the radar. Thank you. Um, so we were expecting to have two representatives from nonprofit organizations, um, but unfortunately, Ani Rivera from Galleria de Raza was not able to make us at the last minute. She had a family emergency, but we're lucky to have Joe Wilson and he has fear from Hospitality House. He has very large feet, so he's going to fill the shoes of two people. Um, so Joe, tell us something about, you know, so what is it? What is it like to be at Hospitality House right now for your clients in the Tenderloin and for staff? Well, we need more root beer, uh, Jen, but um, I think, uh, <laughs> so Hospitality House, just a uh, uh, background, so we're a 50 plus year old organization um, based in the heart of San Francisco, the Tenderloin, uh, south of Market neighborhoods. Um, we have um, six different programs, four locations, um, three distinct neighborhoods. 
Um, and before I go any further, I want to just a special shout out both to Senator Weiner and Assemblymember Chu, uh, good friends um, of various communities. Um, and um, we're fortunate to have both of you at the state level, um, particularly, particularly in this moment, which is, I think, as both of you have. Um, um, unlike anything we've experienced, I think, in recent memory in terms of the totality of um, uh, destruction <laughs> um, that is both happening and is could yet happen. So, a non, you know, we're Hospitality House is a medium-sized uh, nonprofit. Um, um, we document about uh, 25,000 visits uh, every year. Uh, we have uh, two uh, drop-in centers that are designed to be uh, entry points into the behavioral health system. So getting people reconnected to behavioral health uh, services as a way to rebuild the community infrastructure, frankly, that was not built <laughs> during the Reagan era. Um, um, and we're still kind of uh, communities across the state are still grappling with um, that in a number of ways. Um, we have uh, an employment program. Uh, we feel it's very important uh, to get people reconnected to the workforce. Um, over the course of a year, we um, uh, place about 200 plus people into uh, both entry level and mid level paying jobs. I mean, as a way to get people bo both back on their feet, stabilized, and so they can um, uh, both secure and maintain housing. Um, we have uh, a community building program that is designed to get people re-engaged in the community through both volunteerism and we have a trauma-informed leadership uh, project that, that we've operated now for more than a decade. Um, four current members of our board of directors are graduates of that trauma-informed leadership development project. So it's both about individual transformation and organizational transformation. Um, we uh, operate uh, uh, one of the city's oldest but smallest emergency shelters um, uh, in the city. I used to sleep at Hospitality House's shelter uh, 30 plus years ago. Uh, and so uh, very much a product of our peer-based model that really uh, believes in um, community members as assets rather than liabilities. And then um, just dovetailing into the most recent discussion here, we have a community arts program that is more than 50 years old um, and is after 50 plus years, still uh, San Francisco's only free fine arts studio for low income artists uh, and homeless artists uh, in the city. Uh, as we speak, um, we are uh, conducting our, uh, holding our own um, online um, art auction where um, artworks um, by uh, local artists um, are available for bid. Operators are standing by as we speak to, uh, uh, to uh, take your orders. Uh, it's our annual fundraiser this year. Uh, given the context of the COVID crisis, we are making a specific, specific effort to get more money in the hands of struggling local artists. And so 100% of the proceeds from the auction sales of uh, their artwork would go directly back to the artists. And so we, um, you know, we want to make this a special uh, calling out for lifting up and celebrating uh, local artists. Uh, you can tell Joe is a nonprofit executive director because he's asking all of us for a donation. So go, no, for yes. Joe. Uh, so, uh, so again, so are, you, are you closed? Can people still drop in at your center? I mean, what, what's going on there? Well, we've had to. Uh, so the short answer, yes. We Actually, we are still open with reduced capacity uh, in the context of uh, COVID-19 and physical distancing uh, uh, that's required. Um, we are a community resource. Our demand, like demand for services in lots of nonprofits, has not uh, waned during this crisis. It has increased. Um, we think the context of uh, investments uh, that are needed to, frankly, shore up and rebuild our community based infrastructure should be a part of the state budget discussion. Um, 
uh, we should also be, you know, wondering very seriously what happens when the rent comes due. Um, we have to um, look at some ways both with uh, revenue options. Uh, this is the fifth or sixth largest economy in the world still. So we have an opportunity to tap into some of those, um, those revenues. Uh, we have a rainy day reserve. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a thunderstorm. Um, and we also need to recognize that there should be some lessons learned from the Great Recession where the approach was, was really predicated on austerity measures and kind of cutting our way out of the crisis, we should have learned that that does not work. We need to reinvest, rebuild, re-envision, transform uh, the way we've been doing things over time. And I would actually hold our nonprofit uh, sector responsible for uh, promoting the best of possibilities here um, in envisioning um, everyone we serve as a potential asset rather than a liability to make the direct connection between um, housing access and workforce opportunities, to focus on skills acquisition and uh, career pathways, to uh, redesigning our workforce development system so that it promotes um, uh, acquiring new skills and establishing career pathways, looking at uh, a number of possibilities, both that are green economy related, um, you know, um, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning um, uh, capacity for, um, you, know, phys you know, for physical spaces is going to be a, a really uh, desperate need uh, to like, you know, kind of recalibrating how we think about ventilation in yeah. public spaces. Uh, and so there are opportunities for significant investment. Thanks, Joe. You know, did you know that in the chat box, people are putting uh, uh, links to the auction? All right, and encouraging people to donate it. So that's great. Thank you very so, much. You know, we have more than 200. Get a free root beer for a thousand dollar donation. So we'll just uh, make a note of that too. <laughs> we have more than 200 questions uh, submitted in advance to our elected officials here. So I tried to kind of group some of them together and ask you some, but so some of the questions I think are really important is, you know, when people's PPP loans um, run out um, and, you know, around the same time that, uh, that uh, eviction moratoriums for individuals may also be, be ending and the $600 a week unemployment uh, supplements will be ending. So at the same time that nonprofits are going to be losing some of the supports they already have. And of course, we haven't been able to hold our fundraisers. Um, you know, what, what is, and our demand is gonna be skyrocketing as you know, both of you have mentioned, you know, the, the massive evictions are likely in the future. You know, what what can or should the state be doing? What can we be supporting you to advocate for? Um, you know, for long-term sustainability of this really important supply chain of services to our communities. I mean, I, I think it's about. Um, <laughs> you know, having a strong coalition speaking with one voice for money in the budget. Mm -hmm. So in August, uh, we're going to have to redo our budget. Now, it could be bloody if, uh, if the federal government doesn't come through with significant assistance to state and local governments. And it's good to see that there's more some activity happening in, in Congress, in the Senate, U.S. Senate right now um, to come up with a package. So, if you know, that that could be very positive or very negative. So, but if there is any kind of flexibility, uh, I think there needs to be a very coordinated speak with one voice nonprofit ask for significant funds. Um, I also think there needs to be a more uh, a coordinated push for eviction protections on the residential side, which at least we have legislation pending, but also on the commercial side, which has been harder because I think everyone agrees on the residential side that something needs to happen there. David has a bill that I'm co-authoring, Bill Ting has a bill, Senate leadership has a bill, but on the commercial side, including nonprofits, there's really nothing since nine, SB 939 was killed. And so the, I think there needs to be a, a renewed push uh, for that to happen. 
So just to, uh, to add a few things to that, uh, you know, we have been talking about commercial and residential eviction moratoriums, but you are really looking at, um, it's really been the San Francisco delegation that has led on this conversation. And it's been a really hard conversation to move statewide. It, it honestly doesn't make sense to me. Every, it seems like every half hour, there's another national news story about the massive wave of evictions that we are anticipating when the temporary eviction moratoriums are lifted. And, um, and we know how unbelievably destabilizing that will be. It's estimated there are 2.3 uh, million Californians who have lost at least one bread earner in their household because of this, who are tenants. And, and those are folks who could be forced out onto the streets. And, and we're trying to basically have a conversation that says, if you owe back rent, uh, when the eviction moratorium is lifted, you should be given a period of time before you are forced to pay that because obviously you're not gonna have the money on day one. That basic concept is one that we do not yet have consensus over in the legislature. So asking for your help in moving that conversation. And then, you know, as Scott talked about, just thinking about what equity looks like from a budget standpoint and who is bearing the burden of taking care of those who are vulnerable and who is doing okay and how do we balance that? I think we're going to have to have some difficult conversations about it. If, if we don't find a vaccine, if we don't stabilize the curve, we have to go back into lockdown. Um, it's gonna be very, very difficult. So building the support for that. And, and I think for all of you, sharing your stories in a very loud way, and I know you're trying to, but you know, my guess is many of you are spending most of your time trying to triage the very challenging situations you're dealing with in your organizations. I would encourage and ask you to uplift your voice publicly. Um, and just talk about the human impact of what is happening at this moment and what the future could look like if the cuts continue. Uh, we need to hear that. The public needs to hear that. Everybody's sort of hunkered and, and, and hunkered in their, in their homes, but um, if you're lucky enough to either have a job or to be stable in your home, you don't see the suffering that's out there, and we need your voices to, to lift them up. Thank you. You know, we have, um, even before we talk about future cuts, a lot of nonprofits are experiencing problems with state contracts. And, you know, uh, San Francisco has been one of the counties that's been really good about being flexible with government contracts because we know that people like, you know, like child care centers, for example, they're still open because they're taking care of the children of the essential workers. Um, but they're not able to meet their goals, for example, their contract goals of number of children served. And the same thing is true for a lot of our senior meal programs. Um, you know, and a number of people have commented on other problems they're having with the state, their state contracts. And so, you know, what can we do to get the governor's office to, to move on creating some relief for nonprofits with state contracts? I know, David, you signed the letter, more than 1,300 nonprofits have signed the letter. What can we do to actually make that happen? You know, one, one thing I'm going to say, just as a as an aside, and I hate to be the one to say it, and it's weird to say it over Zoom, but you know, as a former supervisor in San Francisco, both Scott and I know that the political influence of the nonprofit community was very real and palpable. And that was a good thing for those of you who are trying to get things done at City Hall. Um, I think it's fair to say that you just don't have the same level of political influence. And what I'm seeing in the nonprofit sector is you are becoming much more sophisticated at how you approach um, policymakers at the state level. And, you know, having Jennifer Fearon as part of your crew is, is amazing, but, but you need bigger voices, you need louder voices to, to heft and sway and do what you need to do because the, I mean, let's, let's put it this way, the influence of other stakeholders, particularly very highly muddied interests, um, often weigh and often sway. So um, whatever you can do to sort of ratchet up the concerted uh, coalition building efforts. And I would also say maybe think about partnering with labor at this moment because labor is also struggling with their workforces and they tend to represent in this discussion public sector workers, but there are plenty of uh, nonprofit unionized workers, as well as the, ca the, the causes and values are the same, and, and thinking about how to join forces there in the way that you've been able to in San Francisco, I think would be, would be effective. Thanks, and I, we really appreciate your comments. We nonprofits are gaining more voice in Sacramento, but not, where, not, not anywhere near where we need to be. You know, uh, Senator Weiner, what are your thoughts on this issue about how to move the governor's office to relieve contract issues for nonprofits with contracts with the state? 
Um, you know, I, the, the governor's office right now, uh, I don't envy them. <laughs> they are, you know, try, trying to first and foremost focus on, uh, you know, trying to bend and crush the curve and the re resurgence that's happening and whether schools are going to be open and the disaster at EDD with unemployment benefits and just, uh, you know, just these gargantuan existential issues. And so it is, uh, it, it's, it's been hard to get them to sometimes focus on some things that we want them to focus on, not because they don't care, but because they are drinking water from a fire hose and they're dealing with like the big picture issues of the future of the state, uh, which in so many ways is contingent on whether we get control of the virus. Um, and so I think that you need to just be really organized and persistent with them and just persistent and persistent and persistent to get their attention and focus. Uh, there have been conversations with the governor directly about nonprofits. He knows that it's an issue mm -hmm. and I'm sure he's supportive, uh, mm -hmm. but it's a matter of, and I, I don't know who, I can't remember who exactly in the, in the administration uh, would be the point person. I mean, obviously Ana Monsantos is his, uh, is his budget uh, person, but um, I, I would, just really recommend um, mm -hmm. just being super persistent with them. Thank you. Um, we also have, um, you know, we've seen the, the governor's, it's a little bit of a complicated question, but we've seen, you know, that some things from state government that are new programs launched, like the Great Meals launch, Great Plates program, for example, that funds restaurants to deliver meals um, at the same, at, you know, 20 times the reimbursement rate that Meals on Wheels organizations get and some other programs um, and that we're worried are gonna go away um, and then leaving kind of without kind of the, those kinds of funds being there for the service providers that have always been there and always will be there. And so these, you know, what thought has been given in the legislature in terms of, you know, how to manage these programs that are new compared to the programs that are existing and ongoing? Scott, you want to jump or? Uh, you can go. So, um, you know, listen, every, every new executive likes to have their stamp on new programs. And, um, and particularly when there are good ideas, and I, you know, I, would, I, I think the Great Plates model of trying to link restaurants and seniors was an interesting model. I would also suggest the Project uh, Room Key program, which is getting monies to hotels to help house homeless folks. Very well intended, um, but the devil's always in the details and the challenge is always, once the, the new flashy idea that has a lot of merit is put in place, how do you make sure it's sustainable and how do you make sure you're not replacing good programs? And, and I think in this time of intense budget austerity, we really need guidance from our constituents and all of you to tell us what's working and what's not. Um, it's always been my belief there's certainly aspects of state government that can be and should be working better. And as we're trying to figure out how to balance $54 billion budget deficits should be on the chopping block earlier. Um, and then when we're talking about new programs, we've got to be really sure that if we're going to invest in new things with all that infrastructure, um, that they make sense. Now, it's hard if someone, if, if someone wants to put out a nice shiny idea for us to be the ones leading, you know, telling the governor, you know, that's, that's kind of a silly idea. It's, we can say that, um, and that, believe you, there are many conversations behind the scenes on that, but if there are outside advocates who say, I'm Jim Wilson and I've got 30 years in doing this work and I'm telling you, it's not exactly the smartest way of going about it. It's not really economically efficient. There are better ways to go about it. And you speak with one voice, that gives us cover and the arguments to then publicly advocate along with you. So um, you're mm -hmm. probably hearing what I'm saying between the lines, but uh, that's, those are my thoughts. Thank you very much. Senator Weiner. Yeah, I, 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 I agree with, with, with David. I mean, it, it's true. There's always, you know, any, any new, any governor is going to have their own priorities and, and that means, you know, resources and, um, and, and you just have to find a way to balance that out. I know it's, it can be frustrating when you say, Hey, we're providing so many of these services for homeless people, uh, for, you know, families. And then you see a, a new program get created and a whole bunch of money put there, I, I, I know that is frustrating, but that's, 
I think, um, you know, for better or for worse, it's, it's uh, probably unavoidable. So, you know, one of the things that some of our participants here have written in advanced questions is concern about the fact that, um, you know, maybe less so for city and county of San Francisco, but from the state, that a lot of the state money tends to go to like older, larger mainstream organizations and doesn't get as much of the smaller grassroots particularly those organizations that are in communities of color and underserved communities. And, you know, what, what are you seeing in Sacramento? What would be effective in Sacramento to, to change that up a little bit? Can you say the first part again? Yeah, so looking at SAC funding, uh, well, just a couple of days ago, the state opened up its uh, new website called grants.ca.gov, which will list um, all the state op grant opportunities that are available to nonprofits. Some right. of them that we co-sponsored a couple of years ago. But you know, we're so concerned, a lot of our people are saying that they're, they're having trouble accessing state funding because they're smaller, they're in communities of color, they may not have sort of the professional grant writers and yeah. so what, what can all of us do together to help improve that situation? Sure, and first of all, I forgot to mention at the beginning, and I should for anyone who, if you're, 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 you're nonprofit, is having some challenges navigating the state uh, uh, infrastructure, I won't call it bureaucracy, it's the infrastructure, um, please, please reach out to my office, 415-557-1300. Um, I'll post it in the chat box or senator.wiener, ib 4 Ian wiener at senate.ca.gov. Uh, my staff in my district office and some folks helping in the Capitol have been working extremely hard uh, since the shelter in place started to help constituents, help small businesses, nonprofits, people in need, so don't hesitate. Uh, to reach uh, out to us. Um, in, in terms of, um, I, I would be interested in knowing more about what some of the barriers are to the smaller uh, nonprofits and uh, maybe there are ways that we can make the application process uh, easier. Um, it would seem to me that we should probably have folks whose job it is to help people put together effective grant applications. Um, you know, we. We recently, we started providing small cities with um, uh, uh, financial support for the planning process because uh, to help them write housing elements and, and just you know, help them. And the same should be for nonprofits that uh, we should have people who help them write those applications. I think one thing I might also add is um, for, those of you that are working on sort of specific subpopulations, just know there are networks of legislators that are focused in different ways. So for example, I chair the API Legislative Caucus, Scott Wiener chairs the LGBTQ Legislative Caucus. We have a number of caucuses that are focused on different things. Uh, there's a mental health caucus, there's an informal sort of housing caucus, there's an environmental caucus, et cetera, et cetera. And, and finding who those champions are and, and reaching out to them specifically to say, there's a need that's not being met. How can we make sure that money gets to the infrastructure of nonprofits that are, that are doing this work? Because uh, as you can imagine, there's sort of a natural inclination at the state level when you're giving money to give money to folks who have proven that they've been able to do the work before. And it's, it's just harder if you're that much more removed to say, I don't know who these folks are. They don't seem to have a track record, smaller organization. Do they have the capacity? It's just easier to write them off. But if you have advocates who are saying, these are the very grassroots nonprofits in this part of the diversity of California that needs to be addressed, we can be your advocates for that. You know, and I will also chime in here that, um, you know, I think that, you know, we shouldn't shy away from the things that we do best. I mean, you know, budgeting in the best of circumstances is about making choices. Choices have consequences. Consequences have faces and names. And one of the things that uh, community-based nonprofits do best is lifting up the faces and voices of struggle. You know, the, the people who are affected by decisions that are made um, separate <laughs> or long distance from, you know, the site of the struggle. And I think uh, just to some of the member Chu's point about, you know, bringing the struggle to decision makers. And that's faces, names, real life implications of decisions um, in communities that are already bearing um, the burden um, without sufficient resources. And we can see over time what has happened with a succession of decisions that we have made and decisions that we haven't made 
they have gotten us to this point where the intersect of these three pandemics, the uh, pandemic of poverty, the pandemic of racism, the pandemic of COVID-19 has decimated communities of color, have uh, shown a light on the inadequacy of so many of our public institutions. And so we are all compelled really to lift up those faces and voices of struggle so that we bring them to the sight of decision makers so they can't say that they are ignorant of the real world implications of their decisions. So I can't imagine any better closing remarks that anybody could have given. Thank you very much for that. Um, but we have just a couple minutes, so I am going to let other people make their closing remarks. But um, I, I can see people in the chat line saying things like, yes, right it on, things like that. So um, Lucy and, and then Senator Weiner and then uh, Assemblymember Shu, can you give us some closing remarks in these last few minutes about you know, what, we should, what should we take away for the rest of our afternoon and the rest of uh, this week? Next week, I guess it's Friday. <laughs> well, I'm hearing loud and clear as the policy director at Cal Nonprofits that there's more we, we can be doing to bring together nonprofit voices and faces and to get them to Sacramento and um, so that they can tell their stories and, and we can support, um, support them in doing that. So that's something I really wanna focus on, um, building on the great work that we've done so far and just doing more and being louder. So thank you. Senator? Uh, what Joe and Lucy said. <laughs> uh, no, seriously, um, uh, in addition to that, uh, you know, we have another uh, five weeks in the session. We got delayed going back. We're supposed to go back last Monday. Now it's 27th is going to be a fast and hopefully not too chaotic final five weeks. And so it's going to be hard to get people's attention on anything. Uh, but I think we have to try to do something before end of session. And certainly when the budget comes back up in, in August. Uh, and then I don't know if there will be a special session in the fall. Um, but if there is, that's another opportunity. So let's, we should just stay in close touch. And again, please don't hesitate to reach out if anyone needs anything. So uh, I'll just say sort of three quick things. First of all, Scott said before, please reach out to us and, um, and let us know what's happening because uh, as Joe put it, and I love the Joe Wilson for president in the chat box, uh, uh, you know, as, as Joe put it, your stories, your anecdotes, your data, your perspectives inform us. You know, we, Scott and I like to think we, you know, we're, we're workaholics, we work around the clock, uh, we try to know a lot about a lot of things, but as by definition, you know, we, we, we know a couple inches uh, a mile wide, and you guys have deep, deep uh, knowledge on issues and perspectives, and, and please share that with us. We, we need to know that, and it's important for us to hear from you because uh, if we don't hear from you, we're hearing from lots of other people. We just need, we need to hear from you. So stay engaged with us. Um, the second thing, um, I'm hoping all of you are part, are active with Cal Nonprofits and really helping to uh, turbocharge the coalition building that is the statewide work that Cal Nonprofits does. It's, it's amazingly important that you have a coordinated voice. It's, you know, it's one thing when I get calls from different uh, nonprofit EDs in town about this or that. It's another thing when you speak with one voice and you can say, we're representing a thousand nonprofits from San Francisco and a hundred thousand nonprofits throughout the state, et cetera, et cetera. So the more you can work in coalition, that actually makes our lives much easier because we're not trying to guess what does the child care sector really want to do? What is the homelessness agenda? You come to us and you say, this is what we need. This is what we want. We've had a lot, spent a lot of time thinking about it. That really helps us cut to the chase. Um, and then the third thing I want to say really to echo what Joe said around the pandemics we have and just how daunting it is, right? The pandemics, and I, and I use the same language, the pandemic of health and of poverty and of racism. It does seem really bleak, but, but I have to say this is to some degree why we all do the work that we do, right? Each one of you probably spent your entire life fighting for the very folks who are at greatest risk at this moment. And to some degree, you know, this is your moment. This is our moment to, to, to lead and to, to really bring our 
and your perspectives, your strengths, your expertise to bear in leading us out of this darkness. And I just want to say, you know, you guys are all heroes and I'm looking forward to, to working with you because we are going to get through this. It's going to be hard. It's going to be dark, but with all of that, all of the collective wisdom that is on this call, I really do hope, feel hopeful that, that someday soon we'll, uh, we'll not only be able to get rid of that idiot in the White House, but uh, we'll be able to, to move our community forward and really build a bigger, a better and stronger community. So, um, so thanks. Thanks for all you're doing. And uh, thank you, Jen. Thank you very much to every, all of our speakers. I know all of you had other things to do today and you're really showing uh, you know, a commitment to our overall nonprofit community by being part of this. So we really appreciate that. Um, in terms of the revenue thing, I did know that Cal Nonprofits is already supporting Prop 15, Schools and Communities First, which will be a new corporate property tax that will bring in a lot of revenue to the nonprofit community and the state government as well. So that's something, one of the many things important from the November ballot. Uh, so thank you everybody for writing in such interesting and smart questions ahead of time as well as in the chat box and everybody have a great rest of your day. Bye. Thank you everyone. Thanks everybody. Stay safe.